your next speaker, Dr. Wendy Balwamini, which I, I'm, it's like very hard to pronounce, but um, is actually uh, one of the leading thinkers around an, in, an emerging trend which we're all thinking about, which is privacy and others. Now, for those of you who've been coming to Inner Tribe over the years, you may remember four or five years ago, we showcased something called the Digital Asset Grid. And the Digital Asset Grid, which I think was something ahead of its time, really picked up on some of the themes that now Wendy's gonna be talking about, about how as data becomes much more valuable in this world to you and your ability to monetize that data becomes core to the way you interact with the digital world, how do you protect it? How do you actually give people the right access? How do you actually think about that entire framework? So uh, Wendy's gonna talk about that in some detail. She's had a long experience and very, very impressive CV. Uh, from her years at IBM where she's worked in various areas including commercialization strategy and I was as I was telling Wendy before I came on Wendy actually went to Caltech and I have a little personal story I got into Caltech but I was a little bit too scared to go because it's such a competitive school that I decided to go to uh, a school here in the UK instead uh, which is Cambridge which I found far much less competitive to Caltech so she's definitely braver than I was so I kind of copped out at that point. So with that, let me hand over to Wendy. Wendy, over to you. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the last afternoon, the afternoon of the last day. I know a lot of people have already headed out to the airport to go home, so uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and I wasn't expecting to talk about uh, Caltech in my introduction, but I just wanted to to, re to, to respond to that and say that he was wise for his years. <laughs> so this afternoon I'm gonna talk about what it means to do AI in a privacy aware world. Now, as you've heard in the talks probably all week, um, AI is making data increasingly valuable. Uh, the more we can do with our data, the more valuable it becomes. But some of the kind of analogies that people use and the ways of thinking about data that people use um, to describe this value are really not correct, right? One of the things we hear a lot of the time is data is the new oil, or this idea that data is a commodity uh, that will be traded much like other commodities of the past. But this is really not the case. Uh, data is very different from a lot of these commodities. It's not a fungible thing. My data is different from your data. And also, um, you as a data user are different from me as a data user. So something that's of no value to me might be highly valuable to you or vice versa. So one of the things I've learned um, working in a field that uses a lot of data, and, and my scientists are constantly trying to get a lot of data. This is a constant complaint. We need more data. Uh, but this is always hard somehow. Why is this hard? Even if someone is willing to pay for data, it is often difficult to get the owner of the data to sell you that data, even if you're willing to pay. And why is that? Well, it's because we're, as, as humans and as economic actors, we're often extremely reluctant to share or sell what we can't value. You know, I may not know what it's worth, uh, and I certainly don't know what it's worth to you, and I also don't know what it's worth to somebody else. So if somebody asks me to sell data to them, I may be very reluctant to do so because I have no way to really set a price. And then the other side of that is, okay, even if I do set a price uh, and I can value this data properly and I, we can agree on, on how much the data is worth, then you have an additional problem that once I've shared data with you, I have multiplied my data risk. If I give it to you, depending on what your security is like or what your risk and threat level is like, I've now increased this data risk. So I've got two things going at the same time. I don't know how to value this thing. And also, you know, it's additional risk to me uh, when I share it. And this doesn't just apply to companies. This applies increasingly to individual customers as well. Um, so I think we're coming out of the era, it's already over uh, in most places, where 
customers are not really that aware of what uh, corporations are doing with their data. Right? Customers have become highly aware of that. Uh, and in many jurisdictions, uh, like the EU, they've insisted on regulations to protect their data. So you know, that, that awareness and that desire for privacy isn't just an abstract thing. It's being, it's being encoded in regulations in the EU and, and soon uh, will follow, at least in some states in the United States, which then drives um, a set of requirements for, for the whole country. As a, a manifestation of this, most customers uh, would terminate a brand relationship over unauthorized data usage. At the same time, the data breach statistics are massive. So every two weeks, we hear about another data breach. And this is often not because we don't have the technology to stop those data breaches. Sometimes it is. But often you find out later that this is something that could have been protected against but wasn't. So what does all this mean? Um, trusted relationships with customers depend critically on data protection. You know, 20 years of trust can evaporate in a very short period of time due to a data breach or an unauthorized use of data, whether that's an attacker from the outside getting into systems and taking sensitive data, or whether that's a use that seemed like it would be fine, but turns out was either in violation of regulation or just in violation of customer trust. So what should we do? Uh, we don't want to stop building AI systems. AI is going to be a transformative technology for this industry and others. So we need a set of principles to try to, to, to work through this and solve this problem. And there's really two core things, two core messages that I want to get across in this talk that if you leave with, uh, I think I've been successful. And the first one is that AI as a technology is not just a user of data, but it can actually be used to protect your data. So that's the first step. Use AI technologies to protect the data that you have. And the next step is to start building AI models without sharing data. So let's go through that. So the first is using AI to protect your data. We spend an incredible amount of time and resources right now as an industry just trying to protect our data from attackers. Uh, cybersecurity spending is crossing a trillion dollars. We don't have enough people to fill all these cybersecurity jobs. We're not using anything close to the amount of information that is actually available uh, to protect our systems. And we're ignoring threats just because we don't have the bandwidth to follow up on all of them. An example here is you know, we've spent some time looking at you know, what does a security professional do all day? Uh, they spend hours looking through things by hand. They have to read news feeds. They're searching for security incidents and online sources. Uh, then they spend hours manually copying and pasting things. So they spend a huge amount of time doing a bunch of manual work that is error prone and time consuming. But yet, despite all this, they're producing a large number of false positives, which mean that when there is a real threat, the reaction is slower. So how can AI help with that? So we talk about reading lots of documents, monitoring uh, streams of what's happening. These are things that AI is very good at. So instead of this world, uh, where the security analyst uh, is looking at a bunch of analytics and alerts, looking things up by hand in data lakes, um, and then essentially spending a lot of time reading uh, to understand the threat level that's out there, we want to move to a world like this, where a lot of that reading uh, is being done by natural language processing systems, fed into knowledge graphs, and actually used to assist the security professional in doing their job. And by doing this, we can dramatically increase the productivity of the people that are doing this work. We still won't have quite enough people doing this work, uh, but we can at least get to the point where they have a chance at competing with the scale of attackers that are coming at our systems. So the second part is 
building AI without sharing data. And this is where there's a lot of really cool technical work going on to figure out how to get around this problem of how do we share data, how do we sell data. We don't really know how to do that. So there's really two principles to that. The first one is around building AI without sharing data, or sharing models, not data. So when you have data, you train an AI model, and you get a model which is separate from the data and doesn't actually contain the data. So there are techniques for sharing those as opposed to sharing the data itself when you want to combine these things. And then the second part, which is a more advanced technology, is to build models on encrypted data. So instead of sharing the data, you only share an encrypted version of the data and build your AI model on that. So let's describe what those things mean. So the first part is to share models and not data. So here's an example. We have a couple of banks. Uh, we have a bank in the United States, uh, and we have a group of banks in France. And they would like to share data, perhaps, on fraud analytics uh, to protect themselves from, from attackers. They can't actually share the data that they have, because that's private, it's cross-border, it's not something that you can exchange. Um, but with, a, with federated AI technology, one bank in the US can train their model on their own data. Another bank or group of banks in France can train their model and their own data. And then those two models, and only the models, and not the data itself, can be fused to make a better model. So what does that actually mean? So an AI model is essentially a group, a very large group, uh, of parameters that are defining how usually a neural network is going to behave. With distributed federated learning, what we can do is take the model from set of parameters from one side, take another set of parameters from another side, and put them together in a way that combines those values into something that is a more powerful model. And then in order to put those things together and guarantee that they actually came from the sources that they said they did, those can be combined on the blockchain and shared. And what that enables people to do and, and banks to do eventually would be to be able to buy and sell those models, knowing what their provenance is uh, and knowing what they might add to the overall larger model. <clears throat> So what this does is isolate the data from the AI. Now, there's still a gap here. And the gap here is that the builders of that AI in both of these banks still have access to that data. In order for the AI scientist or the data scientist to build that model, they usually are looking at the data. Uh, and often, there's many of them uh, and often there are multiple firms involved. Sometimes these are outsourced to, to consulting firms. So you know, the data has got to be shared for that model to be built in the first place. So how do we get around that problem? And that's where we get to the idea of building models on encrypted data. So what does that mean? In a traditional uh, AI model building flow, the data scientist or the AI scientist uh, has a large, has a data set, and they're going to train a neural network probably, or maybe another kind um, of technique on that data. They have access to it. When you're training models on encrypted data using fully homomorphic encryption, uh, which is what the technology is called, that model builder never sees the data at all, which is hugely powerful. Because now, those models can be built by people inside the company, people outside the company, in the cloud. And the data is never exposed. In addition to that, the model itself is encrypted. Uh, so the, the details of the model are never exposed either. So this is a very new and emerging technology that IBM and others have been working on 
um, that is now starting to reach the point where it can be applied in practical cases. So I'm going to describe one of those cases. This is work that IBM has been doing uh, with a large financial institution partner who is very concerned about protecting their data as they build their models. There's a number of concerns. Uh, one is around sharing data between parts of the institution. Uh, and another one is, is simply exposing client data to the model builders. Now, this is something that in today's technology always happens. You're, if you want an AI model built, you're going to have to share that data with somebody. But what's happened here, and work that we've been doing with this financial institution, is we've created the ability to take a set of data from multiple parts of the institution, in this case, a retail banking part, a loan department, and an investments department, to take all that data from different parts of the institution and create a fully homomorphically encrypted data store. So that data is put into the data store, and the AI models are built on top of that encrypted data store. Once that data store is built, then the user of the model can run analytics queries for marketing or for fraud detection or other applications without that data ever being shared. So not only does the data not get shared with anyone outside the institution, it only gets shared in the case where someone actually needs to see it, not just in the case where, well, I want to build a predictive model. So this really creates an entirely new layer of security. Because when we think about encryption and how we've done encryption for the past 10 or 15 years, uh, we encrypt data at rest. That's important. We encrypt data uh, in transit, which is also very important. But it's always been a core principle that, well, to actually do the computation, you have to decrypt the data. And so there's always been that gap, that hole, that, well, OK, I can protect it for most of the time. But when it actually comes time to doing the computation, I have to decrypt the data. And that means somebody is going to have access to it. If they're doing that computation, they're going to have access to the data. So what we're really talking about today is the ability to close that hole and actually build our AI models without exposing the data at all. And I think this is going to be an incredibly important technology for really getting us to the next level uh, of AI in a privacy-aware world. So just to summarize uh, the principles here, right? the first one is your clients and your customers are highly aware of what you're doing with their data. The, the era of tolerating sort of wanton data use is over. Um, and so all of us have to make sure that we're putting data protection at the core of everything we do, uh, even as we're trying to leverage AI to make our businesses more efficient and find new opportunities. But there are ways to do that. Uh, and so the first way is to share only models and not data. And the second way, which I think is going to be transformative, is to entirely lock down the data and only build AI models on encrypted data. And between these two things, I think that as an industry, we'll be able to build and continue our trusted relationships with our clients uh, for years to come. Thank you.